the Chinese state did not take on personal rituals in a way. So getting married was a ritual. You didn't need a marriage license in China before the 20th century. That was a family decision. Now, you had a, a property contract when you got married. You said, okay, this is what the dowry is going to be. And if there was a conflict, then the state could intervene and say, well, let's see your contract. But it was a personal contract. It wasn't a state license to get married. So the state wasn't so interested the way the modern Western state seems to think it's really important to adjudicate some of these things. The other thing is that marriage, family, was about reproduction. Um, it was about producing descendants. However, again, those were sort of family decisions. Decisions of the elders to the family, to be sure, not necessarily the, the decisions of the couple. But if a family committed, I, I mean, committed infanticide, that was not likely to be prosecuted in any way. The state said, well, we, this is, they did occasionally ban it, um, but it, they weren't going after people for it. So the, again, the state was just not involved in those kinds of things. Now, socially, a woman's fidelity to her husband was very important to family honor. And there has been some really interesting writing about the ways that even a man trying to flirt with a woman was considered such an affront to her honor that then she goes and commits suicide and then it becomes a big legal case because now he is liable for the death penalty because he caused her suicide. And this is especially in the Qing Dynasty. So the idea that a woman's honor was, and, and family honor was associated with a woman's honor was, was, was very important in the society. But that wasn't so much a state thing. Do you see what, what I'm getting yeah. at there? Yeah. So, I, I, so I think it, it works a little bit differently. Um, and it really was about honor and rather than morality in a way. I don't know if that makes sense. But it, it's not, oh no, you, I mean, abortion is morally wrong, so you can't do it. That, that was just not, I mean, you're the parents. If you don't want to have children or you want to do something to your children, that's kind of your authority was a more Confucian way of looking at it. In a proper state, everybody will be behaving well. Likewise, everybody behaving well is evidence that the state is doing a good job. And that's where the to go back to the idea of exemplary, re rewarding exemplars comes in. On one hand, the state wants to encourage exemplary behavior because they think it's good for society. On the other hand, to have exemplars in your district is proof that you're a good magistrate, a good state holder. This goes on today. The whole Leifeng idea under the Communist Party, well, not today, but I mean, within recent memory, the, the idea that exemplars are going to encourage, motivate the rest of the population to behave the way you want them to behave is still very prevalent in, in the government today. So for loyal women were a sign, again, that morality was prevailing, that these, these women were behaving in a moral way. Clearly that meant that this was a moral society. More directly, when the state was threatened militarily, as it was in the Song and the Yuan dynasties, um, for to be able to, to hold up women as loyal subjects and say, look, these women are dying for loyalty. They won't let the men invade. Their bodies become a metaphor for the country, right? They won't let them, their bodies be invaded. They won't let the country be invaded. What's wrong with you men? Why can't you men be that loyal? We need, you know, the, this should shame the men into becoming that kind of loyal. So it has a, a, a propaganda use, if you will, in that sense of, of trying to encourage male loyalty by showing them that women are being loyal. Throughout all of those periods, as I've mentioned, there, you, if you had a concubine, you could not elevate her to the status of wife. Legally, she could never be a wife. But in practice, people treated sometimes concubines as wives 
without, and, and nobody took them to court. Uh, if the state didn't have a reason to intervene, chances are no one was, you wouldn't get caught, nothing was going to happen. Another example that um, comes to mind is the Yuan law that says women cannot take property and cannot remarry of their own volition, that, that if they are going to remarry, their in-laws have the jurisdiction of choosing the spouse, and the in-laws get to keep the money, keep their earlier dowry, and they can't take that with them. In practice, uh, often individual magistrates ruled in different ways and said, okay, you can do this even though it's not the it's not what the letter of the law says, but you need something to support yourself and your family's not treating you well, so we will allow this. Technically, uh, in-laws had the right to name an heir. So if my husband dies, um, I have no sons, but I'm going to be a faithful widow, so I want to adopt an heir. Technically, my in-laws have the right to choose that, and of course they might choose their own son or somebody that I didn't like, and often magistrates would say, well, no, we'll give the woman to the right to choose her own heir in that case. Well, in fact, I mean, we don't know a lot about exactly how present lower class women were. We do know the ideal for all women was to be secluded from men who were not their relatives. But in practice, that might mean, so when you go home to visit your parents from your mother-in-law, your brother comes to escort you. You're out on the street with your brother, but he's there to protect you, to make sure that you're not interacting with, with anyone. So it, many modern scholars of modern China have, have noted that the rhetoric of the communist period is, oh, back in the old days, women had to all stay home. But then when you actually look at what they were doing, they clearly weren't all home. And so there's this image that the communists, to a certain extent, encouraged of, oh, now women are free, and back then they were secluded, they were imprisoned. But what the reality was is, is very hard to, to know. Certainly women, I mean, certainly it was a status thing that, that upper class women were more sheltered they would not be allowed to necessarily travel, walk out by themselves, but they would, as I mentioned, travel in a sedan chair, hidden from view, but go visit friends, go, in or, go to a temple. Um, we know they were doing these kinds of things. For women who were, you know, a shopkeeper, the wife of a, of a tavern owner, she's out there serving drinks. Um, now, she's not supposed to be interacting or her husband is always there or whatever, but, but, but these women were visible in public and village women were certainly going to the village well, washing the clothes. Um, they're not supposed to be out gallivanting, they're not supposed to be hanging out with people. They're, and, and so that this idea of inner and outer and the idea of seclusion is a kind of it's, it's like these are appropriate spaces for women, and as long as women are in these appropriate spaces, even if it's outside, we don't think of it as outside. They're in the appropriate spaces. So it, I, I think maybe a way to say it is you just can't be so literal in thinking of it as inner, outer, in, in the literal sense of outside versus inside. How much their role within marriage changed is very hard to get at. and. Um, I can't think of any specific evidence that would say, well, women had more rights in, in marriage per se in the Song than they did later. But definitely in terms of controlling property, they did. But even in late imperial China, women often controlled property even when they didn't necessarily legally have those rights. So uh, the daughter of Zhong Guofan inherits I mean, all his daughters expect to inherit property from him, even though technically women in that period did not have property rights to inherit from their father. So there's a lot of customary stuff that moves against the law. The power of intimacy, the power of sexual attractiveness. Um, if she's got the master of the family wrapped around her little finger, that gives her power. Now it's borrowed power, it's his, really his power, but she can use that. She doesn't have very much legal power. If she gets in trouble, if she hits the wife, if she hits 
her superiors in the family, he may not be able to protect her. Her husband may not be able to protect her from that, or her master may not be able to protect her from that uh, if she gets involved in a lawsuit. But in the context of everyday family relations, if he gives her everything she wants and that no other woman in the family can get to him, then she has some kinds of power. In some sense, it's regarded as married to her husband. It's, it's a completely, there's nothing immoral about being a concubine. Prostitutes uh, were in, in Chinese juridical categories. See, there's a distinction between a good commoner or liang min and people of degraded status. Prostitutes belonged to the category of degraded status. They were legally inferior to an ordinary person. If an ordinary person hits a prostitute or hits anyone of degraded status, the penalty is less than if a person of degraded status status hits somebody who's of good commoner status. By law, concubines were all supposed to be of good commoner status. So you were not supposed to take a prostitute as a concubine, although of course that happened too in some cases. When we use the word prostitute and it's, it's a little bit problematic because that term has so many Western uh, senses to it, and, and even modern Chinese, that the modern Chinese term qi meant something very, very different in earlier periods, especially, well, arguably all the way into the Qing, because a qi was an entertainer and more like what we think of as a geisha in Japan in many cases. So a, a qi was not necessarily a streetwalker. And you, there were there was a range, obviously. There were street walkers too, but there were also very cultivated, elegant women who were what we can only call prostitutes in English because we don't really have a good, I mean, you call them courtesans, but we don't have a really good word in English. We naturalize or take for granted certain things. So high heels are attractive, bound feet are attractive, and it's very easy to look at another society and say, Ew, why would they do that? But it's very hard to see the absurdities, if you will, of our own practices. Um, and just as I, as I mentioned, I mean, just the way we wouldn't, most, most people I don't think would say, well, men make women wear high-heeled shoes. Perhaps at some abstract level that's true, but it, it's very abstract. You don't have men going around telling girls to wear high shoes, high heeled shoes, right? Women go out and buy high heeled shoes because they think they're attractive, they're available, they're available because women think they're attractive and they buy them. So in the same way, uh, at least initially in foot binding, it was considered beautiful, attractive, a way to make yourself pretty, and so women adopted the custom. Now, foot binding came to have many other meanings over time, including gentility, the fact that if you have foot, your feet bound, it meant that you were upper class, it meant that you didn't have to work, it was a sign that, that you were well-bred, if you will. And then with the, especially with the Manchu invasion in the Qing Dynasty, as I mentioned, it also becomes a sign of Han ethnicity, so there, it, it takes on a lot of other meanings that give it cultural significance. Um, what does it mean to be Chinese? Well, we're the kind of people who bind our feet. This is, this is the upright thing to do. And it's very hard to get out of that mindset when you're in it without somebody coming from outside and saying, well, here's another way to look at it. And the, the, what I often really try to convey to my students is that we think we're so superior because we say, ew, foot binding. But we live in a society where women, as I tell them, cut open their breasts and stuff them with things surgically to make themselves more attractive. Is that weird or what? And so it's all, you have to be a little more objective about these kinds of things.